um, from a Christmas devotional that we were doing um, a couple of weeks ago. And I just want to read the word first, and um, we will sort of uh, go to the next thing. Amen. Isaiah chapter 9 says this, The people walking in the dark have seen the light, and those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. A light has dawned. It is Brahanaya. Amen. Um, and, and I'm going to skip to verse 9. It says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And unto us a child is born. To us a son is. I can't hear you. A son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. A mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Your word is not a space filler. We don't have preaching of the word because it's Sunday and we have to do it. But this word that we read, God, is the word that created us. Lord, your word says by your words that, 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 that the world was created, God. Logos, the second person of the Trinity, is the Word. When God spoke, the heavens became. When God spoke, the Son became. I pray in the name of Jesus, the power of your Word would fill this room. Lord, I might be able to say one or two things for people that I can relate to, but it's practically impossible to relate to children and fathers. But you are the father of all that can speak to all so I pray that this conversation won't just be another service because we're here in your name would you show up because we're here in your name would you speak none of us are interested to have a service we've done this for too long but we know your voice when it speaks it fills the void of our hearts when your spirit moves we know it because chains are broken we know it, Lord God, when you move, this room is full of light and joy. Spirit of God, we plead with you to come to us with your word. Give us something from you, God. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me start off by asking a question. How do you know when Christmas season is here? What's the first sign? of Christmas. This is not a very biblical question, so how do you know it's Christmas season in the city? Huh? What, what, how do you know? Snow! Okay. See, back home in Ethiopia, we didn't have snow, so we used to take cotton and, and put it on Christmas trees. Um, it's later in life I found out that it is supposed to be snow. <laughs> another, another way of knowing. How do you know? Guys, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. You. Huh? Jesus. Praise God. You finished the sermon, so we should go home. <laughs> what is in this room? What, someone said it. Decorations, right? And what do you put on the decorations most of the time? Lights. You know, something good is happening when you see light. See, this light is not just really a decoration. It actually points to something deeper that we all need. Light points to something. In the absence of light, we have what's called darkness. The scripture that we just read said, the people that are walking in the darkness have seen the light. See, Christmas is about the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ coming into the darkness of our hearts. As nice as we look, as pretty as this all is, without this light, there will be darkness in here. Without the gospel in our lives, there will be darkness. And it doesn't take much to find darkness in life. If you just pull out your phone, don't do it. If you just pull out your phone and just check the news, darkness is everywhere. 
If you can't find darkness after the service, ask one person, how are you doing in life, my brother, my sister? You say, Xavier, I'm doing good. But how are you really doing? When you go deeper, there's darkness. There's darkness in the family, there's darkness. Some of you guys are confused how you're going to raise kids in this country. There's darkness in the confusion of our lives. Darkness is everywhere. And the message of Christmas is bringing light into that darkness. The challenge though is most of us, please hear me out, most of us are very good at recognizing darkness, but we want to repair darkness by our own works. We know the scripture because we always hear it preached, but the verse before that, on the, and on the eighth chapter of that same scripture, it actually says that these people that were working in the darkness were trying to fix life. You know what they were doing? They were going to witch doctors. They were going to mediums. They were going to, to, to spiritual places looking to enlighten the darkness of their lives. Here's the point. Scripture says, that the people walking in the darkness have seen a great, great light. And those living in the dark of the deep, the light has dawned. We usually try to bring light from under. It see, one of my favorite writers said it this way. The scripture does not say the light sprang up. It doesn't say it came from us. Light comes from outside in. When we wake up in the morning, true light does not come on when we flick off a switch. True light comes on from the sun. This is the gospel. The darkness of our lives actually don't get removed because we do well in life. Light comes when the sun rises. It means the message of Christianity is not self-help. It's not, see, it's not on how well we raise these kids that the light would shine. The light shines because the sun rises. The gospel comes from God to us. God became man and he dwelt amongst us. This is the message of the gospel. It is not from the intellect of great preachers that we bring life. It is the light of Jesus Christ that dawns on us. Amen. It comes from outside our systems, outside our culture, outside our abilities to preach, outside our abilities to organize. The sun rises because it chooses to. The gospel comes into our lives and changes us from him. In North America, we don't have revival because we're too self-sustained. See, if the lights go out, we have generators. If the generators are not working, we can, buy, we can bring stuff. Why is there revival in Ethiopia much more than here? Because we have backup plans. If the generator goes out, we have some way of doing it. If I don't like the preacher, I'll try another preacher. Come on now. If I don't like the church service, I'll stream something else. We try to sustain ourselves. But the message of the gospel is this. The true light of God does not originate from us. It comes from Him. Amen. Amen. So Isaiah says, the people that are walking in the darkness have seen the great light. What did I just say to you? Darkness is a real thing in our lives. There are so many people that are listening to this sermon. It's nice when kids are praying. It's nice when we are having this great service. But there's so much darkness. I haven't lived in the city long enough to admit. But almost every family has some serious darkness. And let's not try to windle down the gospel. The light comes from God and God. Um, that is the gospel. That is the gospel. So, can we do a bit of teaching? So, Isaiah tells us, so how does this light manifest itself? The Bible tells us that that girl answered it earlier. It actually is Jesus who is the light of this world. Amen? So, when Jesus comes, we see a few things. Uh, depending on the time that I have, um, we'll see if we can go through a few points. Chapter 9, verse 6. Everybody reads this word, today's Sunday school, back to the Bible. 
Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, what does it say? Unto us a, son, a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called, what? A wonderful, can we say it again? A wonderful, a wonderful counselor. What does that mean? The council, you need so many things. But let's just point out two things. One, you need knowledge. I need wisdom. Would you go to someone that doesn't know anything? <laughs> you don't. And the other flip side, especially these days, especially this next generation, has a lot of knowledge. You know, a lot of young people used to go to parents back in the days because they did not have information. Now most parents feel like they don't have authority because kids just Google everything they want to find out. So you tell them something, but they Google it and they know more, of, more than you. But this is why parenting is important. This is why fathers and mothers and uncles' church service are important because knowledge is not enough. Wisdom is the ability to live out what you know. And old people, older people, including myself, the value that you bring is not necessarily knowledge, wisdom. Please know that you're important. You're important because you've lived. They Google. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. This counselor, the Bible tells us, is wonderful. Why is he wonderful? Because his knowledge is not unlearned knowledge. Jesus Christ is a God man, a God a God man, which basically means that Christ Jesus is a divine God, the second person of the Trinity. This is what's so amazing about Jesus. Let me read you Isaiah first 40 verse 13. Um, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? You know what's amazing? <clears throat> Jesus Christ does not know because he is thought. There's nothing that you don't know that you were not told. Are you with me? No one in this room knows anything that they actually were not told. The, the most amazing thing about God is God does not know more to tomorrow than he knows today. You know that? God knows perfectly yesterday. God knows perfectly today, and God knows perfectly tomorrow. His knowledge does not increase. If it does, then he sees us to be God, because he is changing. But we believe the God that we believe is a faithful God. You know what the faithfulness of God actually is? The faithfulness of God is not what God does. A lot of us say, God, you are faithful. God does not choose to be faithful. God is faithful because he is who he says he is. Are you with me? Yeah. So the knowledge of Jesus Christ is not informed. We think, do you think we need to inform God? Why do we need to pray, guys? Is it because God does not know what we tell him? No. He knows. There may be some of you guys in this room that are saying, man, this church, maybe this is great, it's awesome what we have here, but I don't really know if you know what I know. This is the funny thing. You actually don't even know what you think you know more than you think you know. God knows about your situation more than you. His knowledge is perfect. See, a lot of us think we think we know ourselves, right? But God knows us more than we know ourselves. He is a wonderful counselor because his knowledge is divine. Honestly, this is what has really been on my heart this week as I was praying. That our God is an everlasting God and His knowledge is infinite. Second thing that you need for a counselor is you need someone that actually knows how to lead and guide. A lot of people can Google, I said. <laughs> the difference between being told 
you, the way you get from here to Pape and Danforth is, here's the instructions. That's knowledge. You know what wisdom is? A GPS on your hands. When you have the GPS, you, don't need, you just need to know what you need to do next. See, God does not just tell us what we need to do. He's there with us to guide us every single step. I love this word. Pastor FM has been sharing this word with us for a long time. Isaiah chapter 42. I will lead the blind by ways that they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths. I love it. It says, I love the second part. It says, We dwell on that for a little bit. You know, this really is what I wanted to share with you. This really is on what's on my heart. I really think this is what God is saying to us. As a church community, we act as if we know, we actually don't. The only thing that we have is this wonderful counselor that knows us inside out, all of our junk, where we came from, our family heritage, the good and the bad, the therapy that many of us need. He knows it. But just like a doctor, he doesn't just say you have a problem. He actually shows you the way. And he leads us, he guides us. Here's what I'm trying to communicate. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. We're one of the first churches in North America that started youth ministry. One of the first churches, maybe two or three, two other, two other churches may have gone ahead of us. And we're one of the few churches that have been doing something like this for a long time. When we started, even today, we actually don't know how the next, what the next thing is going to be. We, we, and I have searched for many church leaders to help us and guide us. Guess what? In all the 10, 15 years of ministry I've done, I haven't found any church that has been where God is leading us. Here's the funny part. A lot of, it's so nice when you see a conference on YouTube, right? Oh, we should learn from this church. Then you call the pastor. How did you guys do that? Oh, no, no, that was a conference. <laughs> How do you guys do it, they ask us. No, 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 you, you saw the conference. <laughs> we, we actually don't know. But here's the beauty. One thing I've seen is that since day one of children's ministry, Youth ministry, young adults ministry, English ministry. It was him that was leading us. Amen. It was him. When he leads, you start to see in darkness. You see, we can't tell people it's because of this or because of that. This, this one thing I can tell you, that on a Friday we had over we had, we had prayer with the parents on Friday night. If you were not here, you missed it. I didn't even mentor half of the guys, and when they're preaching the gospel, they're putting me out of job. How did that happen? It is him leading us. He knows how to lead the blind in a way that they have We don't know how to do that. As a community, may I dare to say, you don't even have your retirement plan planned out, really. It's so easy when children sing and say, let's support the youth. Let's ask you, do you really know where you're going? Are you really living out the vision God has given you? Let me challenge you. Let's, it's so easy like, to be, to be too busy doing Yaga growth for others. Let me ask you, are you actually walking in your calling? The easy thing is to say, let's support the youth and the children. We need your support, please. But let me ask you for a second. Are you walking? And the, beautiful news is 
that you have this wonderful counselor inside of you who will guide you. Amen? Pastor Lenya is looking at me. So I think I'm going to have to sort of finish up here. His wisdom is amazing. See, God works in wisdom because he wants to show off his power. See, wisdom would not be wisdom if we knew what the person was doing, correct? God works in secret. The greatest acts, one of my favorite writers, Tozer, puts it this way. He says, the greatest acts of God that amazed us have always been done in darkness. When heaven and earth were created, the Bible says darkness was on deep. But the Bible then, the next verse says, the spirit of God was hovering upon the waters. When the universe is created, scientists are still trying to figure out how many Milky Ways there are. All that, when all that was done, in the deep darkness, no one saw. God's ultimate wisdom is made manifest when we don't see it. In the darkness, we see his wisdom. When Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God incarnate, was placed in the womb of Mary, I've seen it at the doctor's office. That womb is very dark. No one saw when Jesus became man. When we don't see him, I promise you there is a mystery and miracle in our lives. We doubt God because we can't figure it out. But more than our ability to figure it out, let's just make sure that man, this wisdom of God, let's put our trust in it. Thirdly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you guys remember? Why was it that people did not see Jesus resurrected? Because it was early in the morning. Remember? People were sleeping. Creation. Incarnation, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the biggest acts of Christ of God were done when no one was watching. Do you think because we can't see him, God is not working? Do you think because we don't understand him that he's not here? So Christmas actually means the wisdom of God became a person and dwelt amongst us. When the light comes, he knows. When the light comes, he leads and he guides. It does not mean that we understand what he's doing, but it means that I'm telling you, man, God knows our situations. I'm not giving you some sort of motivational speech. I am more than any other time convinced that our God is so much more bigger than our ability to comprehend him. Amen? Christ is the wisdom of God who became man to walk with us. That is why the Bible says he's a wonderful counselor. Then says everlasting father. I don't have the opportunity to go. This, but some of you guys, young people, may be con confused on this. Why does Jesus, why is Jesus referred to as the father? Isn't Jesus the second person of the Trinity? Just to clarify, because for some of you guys that may be wondering, the scripture is actually talking about Jesus Christ not in relation to his father and trinity, but his relationship to us as his people. See, when a king rules, that king is assumed to be the father of that nation. Haile Selassie, King Haile Selassie, is known as the father of Ethiopia in those days. Right? So kids would go and call him Ababa, and they get money. Right? So there's this idea that the king of a nation is the father, is the provider. That's, that's what it means. Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses and only Jesus people say, oh, Jesus is the father. That is not our gospel. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yeah, we're all confused in these days. So we just want to make sure that we're preaching the right gospel. So what am I trying to say to you? That he is an everlasting and eternal father. Please stay with me. What does that mean? It means that this God that knows perfectly, that understands what needs to get done, is eternal. What does eternity mean? What does that even mean? It means God does not have yesterday, God does not have today, God does not have tomorrow. It means God is endless. 
It means it's you and it's only you and I that look at these kids and say, oh, they're, they're so cute. When God sees, he doesn't see the difference between a 10-year-old and a 60-year-old because he's, he doesn't have a yesterday. He doesn't have a tomorrow. He's I am that I am. He is so much more bigger. God doesn't plan our future because he's already in our future. God doesn't plan our, some of us are hurt because of our upbringing, because of where we came from, our past. Some of us go back and say, man, I can't believe this happened to me 20 years ago. We are defined by the failure of yesterday. And some of us don't even, have not even started living because we're thinking about how great life is going to be tomorrow. And we're missing the point today. When we say God is eternal, it means God is Amen? Amen? There's no next week service. There's no last week service. God has always been in the present now. Amen. This is why eternity is extremely important. If I get emotional, please just bear with me. We need to get back to preaching and consistently communicating this gospel. We have commercial... See, we're blaming Canadians for commercializing Christmas. And we, the church, have commercialized the gospel. The gospel is about eternity. It's never about church attendance. It's never about healing. It's never about having a great service. It's never about us. It's about the light that shines from outside of us and that brings light into our darkness. It's about a God that knows us infinitely. It's about a God that understands every challenge that you and I go through. It's about a God that leads us when we don't even see him. He's able to do that because he's eternal. When we had the last time joint service, I remember sharing this. I remember specifically saying, there is a heaven and there's a hell. And there's eternity. Please watch. Let this not be a sermon. Three days later, four days later, I had a conversation with someone who almost lost their earthly life. And she said, when you are speaking, I don't know, I was just so afraid. I was just, I was just not sure what was happening. She, she came to talk to me, but I was too busy running around. In this room, there may be someone that may be hearing the word of God for the last time. None of us want to come and talk about Bible year in and year out if there's no eternity. This gospel is eternal. It's not about having a community service. It's about eternity. It's about hell, it's about heaven. So if there is anyone in this room who does not know where you will be spending eternity, I plead with you. I plead with you. Christ is here, the light is here. Why do you live in the dark? See, the darkness that we experience, earthly life, bills, marriage issues, and all that stuff that worries us is it's called hell. And it is eternal. What is the solution you may ask? It's in the text. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. The gospel is not about improving your quality of life. It's not about being a better person. It's not about having better church attendance. The gospel is about receiving this gift.